All right, welcome to the ASP.NET Community Stand-Up at a totally different time because it is, well, it is late-ish afternoon here. It is morning time for you, James. Yep, morning in Singapore. Shout out to Singapore. This is awesome. So um, great. Uh, we are going to be covering some community links, and then we are going to be learning all the routing stuff. So exciting. Uh, let's start with this. And just because I can, I'm going to switch up to this view. It's a new view that I set up. I'm so happy about this. Um, OK, so first of all, um, we have, let me share this banner. Oop, that covers our faces. That is where the links are. They are also going to be in the comments. They're going to be in all the places. I will now undo that banner because it's covering our faces. OK, Rad, let's do this. So first of all, this is something I'm very excited about. Uh, I got to work with Mike on this. Um, so this is an 18-part video series on migrating from ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core. Um, this includes not just uh, .NET Framework, but also like updating existing like you know older .NET Core versions to the newest thing. So um, Mike works on a team that that works, engages with customers, like large customers as they're upgrading their existing apps. And uh, so this is this is not like, hey, it's super easy, it'll totally work. This actually digs kind of deeper into stuff like sharing state, session state, authentication, um, longer term migration using YARP and stuff like that. So uh, Mike is a total expert and these videos are definitely worth your time. So that is cool. Um, all right, this went out today. I'm not sure I like this. I think I'm going to have to go back to the standard view. It, it was fun while it lasted. but um, So this is a, a new exciting post. This is something our team has been working on. And uh, so it was, it was announced just this morning. And this is plans for auth and identity in ASP.NET Core 8. So this talks about some plans to kind of simplify things for um, scenarios where um, where you either want to work with a different ad identity provider or you want to have just one single application um, that is kind of hosting its token management stuff. Um, so there is both information in here, um, some fancy diagrams, and so a link to um, somewhere in here, this plan on GitHub, which is where the kind of in-depth discussions been going on actually for a little bit. So there was a long running GitHub issue and Jeremy um, posted our plans actually two weeks ago and there's been some discussion since then. So a lot of great clarifications coming in from David Fowler, Damian Edwards and folks and great questions from community too. So if you are super interested in identity, check that out and I'm sure we'll get Jeremy on here sometime soon. Be into that. So, yeah, so um, on the on the team, we're well aware of lots of lots of feedback about identity, and it's exciting that we're going to get a chance to make it make it better in .NET eight. I you know, it's complicated, right? And I like every time I like study up, and I'll be like, okay, I got this now, and then I'll like come back a few weeks later, and I'm like, wait a minute, what was? Because there's all these different flows, and there's different cases where you know, and then here's Kevin Chalet, um you know, chiming in with like, because uh, he, he runs the OpenID Dict la or um, project and, you know, just there's cases where do you want to support, like which standard do you want to support, which flows, and then if you do that, do you make it super complicated for other people? So my understanding, I believe, is that there's support for, for cookie-based Token storage. Honestly, I read this before and I kind of forget it now again. Um, yeah, and I, I haven't. I've, I've looked at older drafts of the blog post. I'm not exactly sure what's in the latest one, but like one of the things we've been thinking about is like thinking about what what is a very simple scenario. Like right now, mm -hmm. we encourage our, our templates sort of in our docs encourage a complicated situation uh, solution, yeah. even if you have got a simple uh, scenario. So a simple scenario is <clears throat> like a, a simple spa app on the same domain. Like in that yes, case, exactly, you might right. you might just be able to get away with a reasonably simple solution rather than full on uh, identity server and like a single sign on. Like you, you're not using any of that stuff, so. 
simplify the simple scenarios and then also think about the more complex ones. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so, so far, the, you know, I've been reading, I've been following the issue and um, I see that there's cases where some people are like, what about the super complex issue or scenario? And it's like the, this, you know, this will allow you to do that, but it's the goal really, like you're saying there, is to simplify the simple cases, which in a lot of the time, that's all people want. Um, so. Cool. Um, uh, here's, uh, we've been getting a lot of cool posts from Richard Lander on uh, container support. And uh, so this one is he's, he's, uh, just blogging about improving multi-platform container support. So um, we've had some things in here about like, publishing from uh, two different platforms, et cetera. And so uh, continuing to dig in there. And then also if you're if you are into uh, containers in general, we've had in the past month probably three great posts on different kind of uh, container options and, and additional container support. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to throw too much Jason in here, um, but uh, here, here's uh, one from Khalid. He's he was uh, posting about solving .NET JSON deserialization issues. The specific case he digs into is casing mostly. Um, so, you know, in the case where you're, um, you have different casing, Camel casing or Pascal casing, uh, you know, here's like, whoops, I didn't get, you know, all my stuff's null and that's because the case didn't matter or w cases weren't the same and talks about, you know, trade-offs with things like case insensitive. Um, yeah, so it's funny. I was deserializing some JSON just this past week and looking at different things like um, cases where um, JSON is like just kind of wonky sometimes because sometimes it'll be like, oh, this is an empty. I guess people return things that are not always standard. <laughs> you know, it's like um, so. Then I, I ended up having to say, forget about trying to just purely deserialize into a JSON object anyway. Well, it's, it's oh, sort of just how does how does your JSON map to your .NET types? And yeah. like sometimes sometimes things are messy. Like sometimes people have weird conventions where a property will be an object if there is one item in a collection and an array if there are many items in a collection. Like that's something That's cute. exactly the case I had. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like people try to get cute with it and I it, means you've got nice looking JSON, but it makes it more difficult to read and write the, the JSON. And like people love it when you've got a serializer and you can just take some JSON, you take your .NET type and your JSON automatically goes into your .NET type and everything works. But like sometimes the world's messy and you need to do something more manual. Yeah, yeah. Um, two great posts from uh, Anthony Giretti. Um, so here is talking about um, endpoint filters and action filter, which are basically action filters for minimal APIs. Um, so he has some some code samples digging into that. Um, action filters are a great way to really extend and to to build to handle some cases with um, with an API pipeline that can be pretty complicated otherwise. So this allows you to basically say for everything in this thing either before or after do something. So here he's showing a case of logging. Um, there's cases where I've seen, you know, like additional authentication or, um, you know, additional checks or things like that. So it shows uh, implementing with logging and then creating a custom filter. So, so that is the first one. But the second one I've got from Anthony Giretti is on file upload integration with Swagger and minimal APIs. So this one's pretty neat too. Um, here, uh, let me see, my computer is trying to freeze up and I'm going to try and not let it there. Um, so here I'm um, showing before ASP.NET 7 and, or, you know, .NET 7. And basically you don't have this clean upload integration. Um, Swagger doesn't know that you're uploading a file. Um, using iForm file and iForm file collection. Um, now you can basically indicate that in, in the application, and then you get these nice uh, upload things in your Swagger UI. So that is handy. All right, and then from Andrew Locke, this is an interesting post. This uh, was just, I believe, today, and this was on um, client-side validation with ASP.NET Core without jQuery or unobtrusive validation. So 
jQuery and unobtrusive validation have been around for a very long time. It works um, and it basically annotates, you, your model is annotated to say, okay, this is required, this is required in an email address. And then uh, that puts additional data annotations on your um, form fields. And then jQuery kind of, jQuery and the jQuery validate an obtrusive library pop in and they work. Um, and so then that gives you both client side and server side validation for your forms. Um, so it's fine, but it's jQuery is getting kind of old. It's not, it used to be a real simple case where everyone used jQuery all the time. And now this is a case where people are saying, wait a minute, why do I need jQuery? The simple days. So, the yeah. Simple days. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went through and um, explained, you know, now with things like HTML5 constraint validation, you know, here's the overall browser support. Here's this library that he saw from Phil Hack, who maybe knows stuff about MVC, I'm not sure. And then um, shows how to go through and implement that. And um, so that is kind of neat. I've had people ask me about this over the years, so now this is a nice post for me to refer to. Um, some people still love jQuery, so you know, no, I'll, you know, more power to them. That's all great. Um, and so, uh, anyways, and then you know, just kind of wrapping up here, this because um, I've wondered about this from time to time. There is an issue looking at like, hey, should we update from this? And it's basically been a discussion for a few years. And so if you're interested in that, that's a place to kind of look at that um, for further thought. So Andrew's saying, let's get a new non-jQuery thing already. And then I'm just going to, this is your post. This is quite an amazing post. I'm not going to steal your thunder because I'll just turn it over to you, I believe. And, and you, can, um, you can show all this stuff in action. Yeah, so uh, routing in ASP.NET Core, um, it's a big deal. So ASP.NET Core, it's really built on routing, whether you're using minimal APIs or MVC web APIs, Razor Pages, Blazor, um, all of those frameworks use routing to map uh, URLs to your code. So the simple, almost obvious way of seeing this is a minimal API you have a route here, then you've got your code here. When um, the request comes into ASP.NET Core, um, routing will evaluate um, that request, match it off to an endpoint. So this map get is an example of an endpoint, and it will execute it and do a bunch of parameter binding. So uh, routing is great. We have a unified syntax across all the different um, different frameworks that we have. And the syntax is pretty simple and easy to use. Uh, so if I zoom in here, uh, we can see we've got some uh, route parameters here. Um, user ID, we've got book ID. Um, those match over here. So there's some automatic binding built into minimal API to take the value that's in your URL here and automatically convert it to an int and then execute your uh, API. Um, so that's like a, a simple example of a route in ASP.NET Core. Um, but there's lots of quite advanced features in routing uh, that a lot of people either don't know about or they know about, but they haven't memorized off the top of their head. And that when you want to use one of those, you end up quite often referring to the docs. And we've got great documentation around routing, but it's still a bit of a pain interrupting your uh, coding experience to go look at docs. So uh, what we're doing in .NET 8 is we're adding a lot more intelligence around routing to tooling. So everything I'm showing is built on Roslyn. Um, uh, most of the testing we've done in uh, Visual Studio. Um, but because this stuff is built in Roslyn, um, it will light up wherever Roslyn is available. And like even some of these features are available in the command line, like analyzers when you um, build your app, the analyzer will run. And if you're on a CI server, you'll get a uh, error that you've got a warning. So uh, let's enable route tooling. So right now, this is what routes look like at the moment. They're just simple red strings. And we've got a bunch of more advanced usages down here. Um, but they're all just red strings and not terribly easy to read. So if I come into the uh, uh, project file of this little sample app, I'm going to uncomment this. Um, 
the only reason I have this code is because I happen to be uh, have this project inside the visual the the ASP.NET Core SDK. Uh, if you're building a real world app, uh, as soon as you update to .NET 8, oh, um, all these features will uh, automatically light up. If we come back to our program.cs file, we can immediately see some differences. So we've got syntax highlighting of those route parameters. So user ID, um, the squiggly brackets that we use to indicate it are now highlighted in blue. User ID is in black. Uh, we've got our look ID over here, and we've got a optional parameter, uh, which is signified by this uh, little pink question mark. Now down here, we've got some more advanced usages of routes. So routes support catch-all parameters. So mm -hmm. it will match posts and then uh, however many segments come after it. Uh, this is an example of a route constraint. So it's saying this ID value, uh, the text in the URL must match up to a int32 value. Alpha is validating A through Z. Uh, regex is an example of a route constraint that takes an argument. So it's got regex and then the actual regex that will run. And down here, we've got example of default values and routes. So controller and action are not just optional. They're optional, and if the value is missing, these parameters will default to index and home. So these are all examples of slightly more advanced features that people don't know off the top of their head and they might not feel comfortable using just because there isn't an easy way to use them. Like if we jump back to what we had before by disabling uh, route tooling, and then look at our program.cs file. Uh, when everything goes back to red, it's like a much harder experience to read and parse. So that's the first mm -hmm. feature of route tooling. It's uh, syntax highlighting. Quick, quick question, which I, you basically answered by showing, but it, what's the kind of performance impact on this? Like, it looked basically instantaneous. I mean, do I, if I have a large, like, when am I going to start seeing some kind of like, oh, my code is taking a while to load or something? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, we haven't noticed any performance impact when developing this, although our usages are probably much potentially much smaller than some apps out on the wild. Uh, we've done a lot to um, cache um, any parsing we have around this. Um, and also, this is all built on Roslyn. Uh, so theoretically, that means if you're off modifying some completely different file, so you're off modifying your DB context, uh, mm -hmm. any changes you have here won't have impact over here because this has already been parsed and everything's already been loaded. Um, but it's certainly if people notice slowdowns when enabling this, um, it'd be good to get that feedback and let us know on the uh, ASP.NET Core repo. Um, one other question, since you mentioned that this is all based on Rosalind, I had a question here from Sal about uh, would this be available in other IDEs? It does seem like at least the, the, the um, extensibility points from Roslyn are, are there if they did want to implement it, right? So we've got a bunch of analyzers um, as part of route tooling. Those should light up everywhere um, that uh, Roslyn analyzers are available, um, including on the command line, like I mentioned. Um, oh, right. There's uh, also completion providers. So that's a slightly less known extension point for Roslyn. Uh, again, it will depend upon your uh, IDE and like what it supports. Um, so I'm not sure whether the VS Code would support completion providers. Um, I know VS Code doesn't support syntax highlighting. Um, again, syntax highlighting is it's built on Roslyn. It's just about whether your IDE um, will actually use that information. Um, so although those things aren't supported today, there's no reason um, they couldn't be added in the future. Um, this is all just Roslyn code and it ships with the ASP.NET uh, SDK um, and uh, it's, it's available to use. It, just, it really just depends upon what your ID, IDE supports. Okay. 
Let me take one more question and then I'll let you get back to it. Um, yeah, this go one ahead. is this is asking: uh, Is it possible to write custom IntelliSense or highlighting on strings like the routes are doing? Um, and I know they're they're like this says there's an attribute. Um, I think there was some work to kind of make this easier to build recently, wasn't there? Like yeah, so I'll, I'll sort of jump into a little about how this works. Um, at a very high level. So uh, we can see we've got syntax highlighting down here on all these map get calls and also this map controller route. Um, mm -hmm. Any route or any string that you assign to something which has a string syntax attribute on it will automatically light up. So for example, route pattern factory dot parse, if we F12 into this API, we can see we've got our method, but we've also got this string syntax of route. So this is what we're using to identify uh, this string happens to be, be a route, and let's highlight it. Um, so that's why when we now pass the string to it, uh, it's automatically lit up. And if we F12 into map get, we can see um, this is ASP.NET core code. Um, we can see we've got string syntax of route. So uh, it's possible if you are developing your own uh, your own framework and you're working with routes, if you annotate it with string syntax route, um, things just should start lighting up. Um, I think part of his question is, can we write our own um, mm -hmm. highlighting of strings? Uh, at the moment, the answer is no. Um, Although this is built in, on Roslyn, that's an example of an API that's currently not public. And it's currently internal, not because we want to, like the .NET team wants to hoard it and keep it to ourselves because it's like some advantage to us. Like we'd love for people to be able to write their own syntax highlighting like this. It's just a matter of um, we haven't had the resources so far to make it public API like we have with analyzers or completion providers or fixes. So yeah, that's that's how it works at a high level. Um, mm -hmm. But right now you can't you can't implement your own. Um, but if you're interested in that, I recommend going to the Roslyn repo and creating an issue and saying you're interested in adding your own um, highlighting to strings. Um, I'm sure the team would love to get that feedback and. Um, eventually be able to prioritize and make this feature public. Cool. All right. I'll let you go back to stuff. And then we had a request to bump up your font size too. Cool. Yeah. I can do that. Uh, so next feature I want to show is uh, highlighting of parameters. So when you put your mouse cursor over a parameter in Visual Studio, you can see it's highlighted both where it's declared and also its usages. So we've got something similar with routing. Now the basic example down here with this call to uh, controller route is if we uh, select controller, we can see the route parameter is now highlighted. Uh, this is a pretty simple example, but if we choose user ID over here, we can see it's highlighted not just here, but also uh, the place where it's used, which is which is pretty neat. Nice. Uh, a more advanced usage is like book ID. We can see it's not just highlighted over here in the method signature, but also the places it's used within the method. So this is just designed to make it easier to understand how does my route parameter match up with where it's used. And this is simply just match based upon the two names. And when we see the match, we do highlighting and just go through and we tell tell Roslyn, uh, hey, highlight this parameter throughout the um, throughout the uh, code. Uh, yeah, so highlighting it's a pretty simple example. Um, the next thing I want to show is auto completion. Um, so uh, everyone's familiar with auto completion. If we've got builder over here. We can start typing in builder and we'll get some autocomplete and um, IntelliSense will recommend, hey, you've already got builder before, let's start using it and so on and so on. Uh, so we now have autocomplete for an, an IntelliSense for these route parameters. So for example, if I remove book ID, imagine I'm 
I've written my route and I'm now adding my API, uh, my implementation. So if I go int and then space, we can see we've got book ID and we've got a note that this is coming from a route parameter. So what we've done is we've parsed this route parameter. We also then inspect where it's been used. So in this case, it's a minimal API. So we look at the signature we have up here. We see uh, you've got a user ID here, you've got user ID here, so that's already been used. Uh, but book ID is an unused parameter. So let's just prompt you and say, it's available for you to use and select it. And this also works in the other direction. So if we add a new parameter over here and we wanna add it here. So we hit the squiggle character to indicate we're adding a new parameter. Um, new parameter here pops up and we can quickly add it and we're good to go. So it's just a little time saver. It should make it a bit more easier to add uh, new route parameters. And also because you've got IntelliSense, you don't need to worry about typos as much. So if you um, perhaps type a new parameter here, you make a typo over here, uh, you wouldn't know about that until you actually run your app and you get an error. Cool. Uh, so although everything I've been showing so far is in minimal APIs, um, mm -hmm. all these features are available in controllers as well. So here we can see uh, we've got a uh, attribute up here to specify our route. So in this case, this is like a route prefix that is applied to any uh, combined with um, routes defined on actions. And uh, this blue bit here, this is an example of a of token replacement. So when we um, calculate and bind all the routes for this controller, um, this token here will just automatically be replaced by uh, to do. Um, so we can see we've got uh, syntax highlighting, um, we've got uh, highlighting of route parameters. So ID here is highlighted, so we highlight its usages and also um, auto completion. So if I add the parameter back again, we can see again we've got page, we're detecting it up here and we're automatically adding it. And something I didn't show before, uh, we've also got a fixer um, here. So uh, we detect that you've got page up here. It isn't used down on our method signature. So rather than using autocomplete, you can also use a fixer to uh, automatically add that parameter. Nice. Cool. Uh, so yeah, jumping back. Just, just the kind of like overall, like not just thinking of it as an untyped unchecked string it's really kind of treating that as a as code right yeah nice. like we've we've thought about like not just a route in isolation but how does it integrate with your code because there are there are quite well defined rules around how do the values and the parameters here and your route bind to the parameters over in the minimal api or over in your uh, action and mm -hmm. it's just around providing tooling to like help you to, to make sure that the way you're using your route and your MVC action or your minimal API are, um, are valid. Nice, okay. Okay, the next place we've got autocomplete is of uh, parameters of uh, route constraints. So route constraints down here are signified by this colon, uh, so if we want to add a new route constraint, um, you hit colon and you get a big drop down list of all the available route constraints. Now I, I counted these up in ASP.NET Core and there are actually 18 uh, that come built in and you don't wanna have to remember 18 prefixes and what exactly they do off the top of your head. So now mm -hmm. you have autocomplete and you've also got a nice description of what exactly the route constraint can do. So it's very easy to say, okay, we've got user ID. We want to make that an int. Uh, we will have a min value of zero and we'll have a max value of, of 10,000 and we're done. Yeah. So previously yeah. you might've needed to look up that information and documentation. Uh, now mm -hmm. it's all available at your fingertips. Uh, so right now, uh, the constraints that we show in the drop-down are just the built-in constraints. 
Uh, one of the features of ASP.NET Core is you can add uh, custom route constraints. So you can say add routing and then supply some options here. One of the APIs on options is you can specify a constraint map and you can specify your own custom constraints. And here you specify the type of constraint. Uh, I haven't got one ready, so I'll just reuse the uh, internal in constraint. So now when you specify my custom constraint, you can come down here and specify, like, specify it like that. Now at the mm -hmm. moment, this dropdown list, it doesn't have that custom value. Uh, a feature we could potentially add in the future is using Roslyn, we can detect when someone uses add routing and constraint map and detect mm -hmm. someone setting a new value and when that happens, we can uh, then pull out that value and just drop it into this uh, autocomplete list. Uh, like I said, we haven't got that at the moment, but it would be an interesting feature to add in the future. OK. Uh, so that is autocomplete. Uh, the next set of features we have is we've added a bunch of analyzers um, around routes and route usage. And there are quite a few. I, to be honest, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. So I'll, I'll remember the ones that I do I do know. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll demo those. And I think the, the first one and the most probably potentially most powerful analyzer and most useful analyzer is one which looks at the syntax of routes and lets you know when you've done something wrong. So an example of doing something wrong might be you have a route parameter, which is both optional and catch-all. And if you do this, um, the route is actually now considered invalid. Now, previously, mm -hmm. the only feedback you would have that you've done something wrong is you would get a... Well, we've got a, a thunderstorm over here in Singapore. Oh, nice. I was wondering what that was. Uh, give, give me one second. I'll just close the window. OK. <laughs> If anyone can see while well, James is doing that, he's got a pretty cool poster on the back behind him there. All right, things should be a bit quieter. Um, so this is an example of an invalid route constraint, uh, an invalid route now. Now previously, the only feedback that you would have that you've done something wrong is you would run your app and you would get a error at runtime. And this is kind of annoying experience if especially if you're learning route routing for the first time and you're learning ASP.NET Core, because you could be happily typing away mm -hmm. with your route, you run your app, you get an error. So now we have immediate feedback via tooling that there's a problem. So uh, this example here, uh, it's saying a catch-all parameter cannot be marked as optional. So that's immediate feedback that, okay, this previously optional parameter, um, I can remove the question mark and now it's valid. So there are lots of examples of things you can do to make a route invalid. Uh, another example might be you have two route parameters with the same name. Mm -hmm. um, so here we get a message saying this user ID parameter is now, uh, it appears multiple times. Another example might be uh, if you've got a route which starts with a tilde character um, but isn't followed by a forward slash that's also invalid. Uh, another example is um, if you've got consecutive forward slashes, so you've got like an em empty segment that's also invalid. So there are a whole bunch of ways you can um, write an invalid route, even to the like very obvious ones, like um, perhaps you're going through and you forget to put the close character on a mm -hmm. on a uh, route parameter. Now there'll just be a warning saying, "Hey, you've got an incomplete parameter." you need to have a matching open and close tag. So these show up both as squiggles and also down here in our um, list of uh, warnings. Uh, it will just tell you everything um, that you've done wrong and also give you feedback about where exactly that is. So right now it looks very, very obvious that uh, this route has some things wrong with it. 
But mm -hmm. if we imagine we go back to what routing used to be, so we disable route tooling, and now we just go back to a simple string. Like, oh, you fixed all your errors. Yeah, That's it's, great. It, yeah, it's, it's uh, <laughs> no more squiggles. We've got no issues found. All right, deploy it. Yeah, ship it. Um, <laughs> so, so it's just about like tightening up that developer loop. Um, mm -hmm. All these warnings and errors that previously you would have to run your app with trial and error until you get things working just right. Now you get immediate feedback. So I think that's the, the most powerful analyzer we have. We've got some other ones around how routes are used together with your APIs. So an example of that is we've got an analyzer that checks uh, optional parameters bind to uh, values that are also optional. So an example of that is book ID. So book ID is optional. That means uh, when it's matched, um, it could match just this value. So we could have users one, then display their books, or it could match the entire thing. So users one books, then book ID 10. Both of those are valid. Um, but if we imagine we have just this first one, so there's no value for book ID, and book ID wasn't nullable, like what what happens here when we bind this? Like we've, we haven't got anything to bind to this integer value. Like should it be zero? Mm -hmm. Should it be negative one? So in that case, we now have an analyzer that just tells you, hey, this book ID argument should be annotated as optional or nullable. Um, so it succeeds. So if we go back to what we had before, so we've got an example of a fixer here. We add in the question mark again, and now if book ID isn't present here, this will just simply bind as null. Um, so another uh, analyzer we have, and one which I think is going to be quite useful for new developers. And to demo this, I'll just disable route tooling again. Is uh, it's common for people who are new to ASP.NET Core to write routes like this. So they might want to have an API that um, matches product, and then you can either specify the name of a product, so the string, or the ID of a product, uh, which would be a uh, int. Now, if you're new to ASP.NET Core, you might think this works, because you're kind of doing method overloading. You've got one method which takes a string and another method which takes an ID. Mm -hmm. But from routing's perspective, these are these two routes match the same thing. Yeah. They're both just saying, I have a product, and then I have a segment which follows afterwards. So whether it is product, um, widget, or product 10, mm -hmm. this will match both of these. This is just saying any value. And the fact that these two names are different, that really doesn't matter. Like the name really only matters when um, it's binding over here. So this would create a ambiguous route. And when someone typed in one of these URLs, they would get an error saying, you've got two routes that match the same URL. I don't know mm -hmm. which endpoint to send the request to, whether it's this one or this one. I'm just going to throw an error. So today, I think for people who are new to routing, this is not obvious behavior. So we've got an analyzer which will detect it. So if I come back and I enable route tooling again, uh, we give Visual Studio a second to catch up. So we can now see we've got some squiggles here. And it's just saying route product name conflicts with another handler route. Uh, an HTTP request will create an ambiguous match error. And you can fix this config by changing a route's pattern, HTTP method, or uh, add route constraints. So in this okay. particular example, uh, the fix would be to add, well, there are a bunch of fixes. You could like go the RPC style, where you could say product by my name or by ID. Um, mm -hmm. I have 
I'm sure anyone who's doing like is big into rest would be crying out, no, don't do this. Um, <laughs> but uh, a slightly more restful way of doing this is adding a route constraint. So you can add a constraint, the alpha constraint, say name should only have uh, characters A through Z. So we'll add the alpha constraint here and we'll add int constraint down here. And now because of these constraints, these two routes aren't, won't create an ambiguous match and will now succeed. So it's a, a cute little, a cute little analyzer, I think, to help people who are brand new to uh, ASP.NET Core. Nice. Um, one, I don't know if you said, so recently we also got the, I forget what it's called, the, the string, basically the, the code analyzer and IntelliSense and stuff support inside of strings also has added more stuff for regular expressions. Is there any, does it actually show pattern help for the regex that you have there? Uh, you may miss one down here. Um, no, for the one that's in the constraint. Oh, in this one? Uh, no, yeah. it won't. So okay. yeah, we've, we've thought about that. Uh, right now it was just too niche a feature. So you, that's you're a pretty, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you're right. You notice down here, we've got a regular mm -hmm. expression. So this is an example of a regular expression doing syntax highlighting like we have, we now have with routes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this this one in here, um, it's still just a uh, red string because it was just too much work to yeah. have the concept of an embedded language. So regular expression then embedded inside another embedded language uh, yeah. in this case, right? <laughs> Yeah. So like maybe if we get lots of people asking for it, we can consider it. But I think I think it might just be one of those things where uh, we'll just have to accept that this is a red text. Sure. Yeah. Um, we had a question. Um, don't think you covered this. Is as parameter attribute working with this new tooling approach? Yes, it is. So okay. um, uh, let me let me do a let me do an example. So you can have public class like my my DTO, say user DTO, and then say here we've got get rid of this guy, and you can go. Where is it? Like I think it's as parameters over here. And then, this is complaining. Oh, it's complaining about this. Or is it over here? I can't. I can't remember exactly how as parameters works. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, that's good. Is it? Yeah, so down here, yeah, so here we can see we've got this DTO, we've marked it with as parameters, and you notice mm -hmm. when we do this open squiggly brackets, we're not getting name prompted here. Instead, we're getting the um, two parameters down here because we're saying we're not binding directly to this, we're binding to the parameters on this. So yeah, this is an example we can see uh, ID and username, they just automatically show up. And does it work the opposite direction? So password, yeah. So now we get password over here. So yes, nice. the, the, the simple answer is yes, as parameters works. <laughs> wow. uh, it's a, a, a cute little feature of minimal API and MVC. A lot of people don't know about, um, but yeah, uh, we, we, we thought about that. Cool. Any any other questions? Um, no, I think that's it. Cool. Um, so final thing I'll show is uh, a lot of the things I've been demoing here, it's been against minimal APIs. Um, I briefly showed uh, controllers work, um, routes on controllers. Um, so you get the same experience. If you start messing up your routes here, you'll start getting little warnings that 
you need to have matching characters and the sky and all the analyzers work, um, the the autocomplete works. Um, yeah, so all, all the features work here uh, in MVC as well. Uh, we've also got syntax highlighting on and uh, analyzers running inside Razor pages. So here we've got our route. Um, so you nice. specify a page directive, and here you can see we've got a literal index, and then we've got our, uh, our ID. And then likewise, this will also work in uh, Razor that's used with um, laser controls. And yeah, I, I think that's it. Um, so that's route tooling. Um, it's available in .NET 8 previews today. Uh, there's nothing you really need to do uh, other than install the .NET SDK and update your uh, your um, target framework to .NET 8, and then things should just uh, automatically start lighting up. Um, and then you, so those light up things, and then there's those two packages you referenced. Are those? Oh, yeah. So these, this is just because I happen to be inside the ASP.NET Core SDK. Um, oh, okay. In the real world, you don't need to worry about these. This is um, this is just because uh, I'm literally inside the ASP.NET Core solution. In the Got real it. world, all you need to do is update target framework to uh, Net 8.0, and you're good to go. Fancy. Okay. So, um, so I think that's pretty clear. Um, the I, I can bring up the link again to your blog post because you blogged um, some of this stuff in depth too. Um, and then, um, is this is this feature like is this done? Or is there more stuff that's in progress? Or uh, I think it's pretty done at the moment, um, at least for .NET eight. So feedback certainly welcome. Um, I'm sure once eight ships, we'll get a lot of people uh, like trying it out and giving us suggestions and filing bugs. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I think the, the call to action is download .NET 8 and give it a try. Um, if you've got a really big solution with lots of routes, I'd love to hear whether you notice a, any performance impact. Um, in that case, it would be great to take a look at your solution and see if we can figure out how to, how to make it faster. Cool. Awesome. OK, well, that was great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, you answered all the questions, and that was uh, I'm excited about it. A lot of those things are just nice kind of quality of coding things that are, like you showed, fix the problems as I'm typing as opposed to wait for me to run the app. So, Yeah, I, I love taking features that we've already got and making them better. Like I think adding new features to minimal API or MVC, like, that's great, but probably not a huge number of people will use that feature at least immediately while mm -hmm. something like route tooling like routes are everywhere in your app and everyone should immediately be able to uh, be able to benefit from this like it would be interesting hearing people with big existing apps they update to .NET 8 and then suddenly the analyzers start warning them about hey did you know that this route you happen to have had an ID that are like a route parameter which appears multiple times. Maybe they've just never noticed because no one ever uses that API. Like that would be mm -hmm. uh, an interesting side effect of adding these new analyzers. Um, one one question is, what part? In what way is this like tied to .NET eight? Is it does this is this new like features that are in .NET? Because it seems like analyzers and tooling and stuff is doesn't like I, I don't see how that kind of fits directly with the .NET 8 version. Is that just because how that's how we ship code? or uh, It's partly that. Um, so when we added these analyzers, we added them in such a way they only run .NET 8 or later. Um, okay. But another thing that was added um, specifically for this feature is annotating these uh, attributes everywhere. So <laughs> adding this string, string syntax. Like older versions of .NET um, wouldn't wouldn't have wouldn't have these. Um, so Got we it. use okay. these to figure out like is something a route, 
Um, that was the feature I was trying to think of earlier, that string syntax. That's that's I've seen that used in a few places lately. Yeah, so we we use that as like the source of truth to figure out is something a route. And then additional features that we have light up then uh, light up if a, if an API is the right shape. So for example, um, we detect, do you have a, a string with the string syntax route on it and then mm -hmm. have a delegate argument at the same time? And if you have both of these, then we assume that this is an example of a minimal API and minimal mm -hmm. API features like highlighting this and this start lighting up. And then sort of similar in controllers, we've got API which detects as are these attributes used on something which has the shape of a controller and this method has the shape of an action. And if it does, then we start lighting up features around like highlighting and autocomplete and, and stuff like that. So yeah, for that reason, this uh, string syntax um, attribute is, is quite important. Very cool. Okay, well, I guess we can wrap up there. Um, have a great start to your day as, as, as others of us in different time zones are ending ours. And uh, I will play us out with a promo. We've got Azure developers.net day coming up on April 5th. So I'm going to play a, play a little trailer and wrap us up. So thanks a bunch, James. All right. Bye. If you're a .NET developer, you have to be at azuredevelopers.net day. It's going to be on April 5th, all day long, live streamed on our YouTube with speakers from all around the world talking about super cool topics that you don't want to miss. Hi, I'm Byron Tardif, and I'll be talking about high performance gRPC applications with .NET and how we use .NET to enable the app service platform. Hi, I'm Matthias, and I'll be talking to about Cosmos DP and functions and doing a deep dive in monitoring. Hey folks, I'm Savannah. Are you interested in getting your .NET app up on Azure in a couple of minutes? Come check out .NET Day. I'll be talking all about the Azure Developer CLI. Hi there. I'll be talking about how we can diagnose complex coding issues with Azure App Services. See you there. Hi everyone, I'm Catherine. I'll be talking about the developing for Azure Redis Cache. See you there. Hey, we'll be talking about Yarp, a reverse proxy. Uh, it can help you with management and scalability of your services. Hello, my name is Karol Zygmunt, and together with Miha, I will be presenting about YARP, and we will show you as well how to use YARP for migration of .NET Framework to .NET Core, so come and join us. We'll be sending SMS with short URL using Azure Communication Services. Use the link below to register so we can save the date, and we'll also be having lots of Q&A, so bring your questions and we got your answers.